So it's been a great uh, uh, conference here. I've uh, learned a lot, and uh, uh, thank you particularly for the introduction there. Uh, uh, so my uh, a remit for this talk uh, was to say something about the main turning points in the study and understanding of human evolutionary genetics, uh, and also something about major questions and issues for the, uh, for the future. And this uh, was to be uh, some personal choices uh, seen through the lens of the work of my uh, team. So I will talk mostly about genetics, uh, and I won't have anything to say about linguistics or uh, the environmental or climatic backgrounds, not because they're un unimportant, but uh, just because I'm a, a geneticist. And, and thinking about this talk, uh, I'm struck by something that Rob said in his introductory talk. He said that he expected by the end of the conference that a lot of the things that he said uh, would turn out to be wrong. So in, in my talk, uh, I'll, I've prepared some things to say about the future uh, and whether those really turn out to be thoughts about the future or thoughts about the, the present because of things that we've heard about uh, during this meeting uh, is something that you can judge. But I think if they turn out to be more uh, present than the future, that's a mark of the, of the quality and interest of this meeting. So uh, human evolutionary genetics, uh, where does that begin? I think any starting point is uh, uh, arbitrary. Uh, I've uh, uh, chosen to focus on the last uh, uh, half million years uh, uh, because that's where more is, is going on, I think. Uh, uh, so, but even within that, uh, uh, where specifically should we start our, our thinking? Uh, and, and here I, I picked out this uh, fossil, the Red Lady of Paviland, uh, who you uh, uh, may not have come across, uh, but uh, was discovered in South Wales by William Buckland uh, in 1823, which conveniently is uh, almost a couple of centuries ago now and uh, uh, is arguably the, the first human skeleton that was recognized as ancient uh, at the time of discovery uh, and as a suitable subject for, for scientific investigation. So uh, according to the, the standards of the, the time, it was interpreted as a, a Roman period uh, uh, female. So this was uh, uh, fitting it into the, the short Bible-based chronology uh, 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 that was, was commonplace then. And I should point out that William Buckland was not uh, an outsider to the scientific field. He was a, a professor at Oxford University, and so this was mainstream thinking. Uh, but now considered uh, upper Paleolithic and, and male. So really illustrating how our uh, interpretation has changed in a couple of centuries. <clears throat> and uh, a more precise and perhaps more uh, natural uh, uh, cent centenary is that of uh, this paper by 
Hirschfeld, and Hirschfeld uh, published exactly 100 years ago on serological differences between the blood of different races. Uh, and uh, really the, the starting point of human population genetics. Uh, and I couldn't uh, resist uh, <coughs> showing you one extract uh, from it. I don't know if there are any journal editors in the audience, but uh, I would wonder how they would react to statements like this. The exact statistics with regard to the different tribes, <coughs> provinces, <coughs> anatomical structure, etc., will appear in an anthropological journal. That is, the, the underlying data is not included in this uh, study. We examined 500 to 1,000 persons of each race, so good numbers. But for the Germans, we quote from memory uh, the results, because the table of these is unfortunately not to hand. Uh, uh, so uh, scientific publishing has changed a bit in the last 100 years. So in, in the next part of the talk, I'll uh, focus on how did we get from the thinking of 1823 and 1919 to the present. Uh, and uh, if I had to, to sum it up, I would say it's data, DNA, and dating, which are not uh, uh, in, uh, entirely independent, but rather overlapping areas. Uh, we've come to appreciate the diversity of the fossil record. Uh, uh, we have, we've had enormous progress in sampling and analyzing present-day genetic variation. Then there's really been a, a major transformation in the field uh, with the coming of the ability to sample and analyze ancient DNA. Uh, uh, and then reliable dating has, has really been uh, key to our interpretations. And I think it's, it's impossible to overemphasize the importance of uh, reliable dating, as we've heard about in, uh, in several talks in this meeting. So uh, uh, several of the people who work with fossils have emphasized the sparseness of the, the fossil record. Uh, but looking at it more from outside, we see an abundance of, uh, of fossils. And strikingly, uh, several of them, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Heidelbergensis, were all known during the, the 19th century. Uh, so so the, uh, the, <clears throat> the start point of this uh, uh, area was, was uh, well established uh, more than 100 years ago. And of course, since then, there have been uh, uh, <clears throat> enormous uh, <clears throat> expansions of the uh, uh, the, the fossil record, both in more uh, ancient times and uh, more recent times. <clears throat> and our um, ability to, uh, to uh, uh, assay and understand genetic variation has really transformed beyond recognition from the, the days of blood group typing through uh, uh, many forms of analyzing protein markers, things like RFLPs and STRs that the younger people in the audience have probably never uh, heard of, to the, uh, the current ability to uh, uh, analyze DNA sequences, uh, starting with Sanger sequencing uh, uh, moving to large-scale SNP uh, genotyping and, and uh, 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 
current sequencing technologies. And I, I won't say very much about uh, developments in uh, uh, theory, but uh, uh, of course the, the theory of population genetics was developed in the early part of the, of the 20th century by Fisher and Wright, among others. And it's very striking to me that, that their thinking is still the starting point of uh, much of the work that we, we do now. Uh, so with wonderful technology to analyze uh, our data, then we need interesting samples to work on. Uh, and this has been quite a, uh, a, a difficult issue uh, 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 over, the, over the time. And much of the thinking about that came to a head with the Human Genome Diversity Project, for which Luca cavalli Swartzer was the, uh, the, the figurehead. Uh, and here is a, uh, a, a quotation. This research needs to be conducted as quickly as possible before small native populations, such as those in South America, become extinct. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, this, this rather uh, thoughtless uh, statement does encapsulate some of the uh, early thinking about such sampling uh, and uh, led to many difficulties with the project such that it never materialized in the form originally intended. But I think there are two important outcomes from the project. And first, there's a, a panel of cell lines with DNA samples available to everyone that we've heard about many times during this meeting and I will uh, come back to on some occasions. And then more than that, uh, thinking how we should really go about sampling and involving the, uh, the different communities in every stage of that. And, and every project that's come after uh, uh, the HGDP has uh, learnt those lessons and I, uh, and I think our, our current uh, uh, work really owes a lot to this, uh, to this early project. Uh, and part of the, the sensitivities that came to a head then were due to, or had their, had their roots in, in the thinking about race and racism that was part of the history of our, our area that we, we may not like to think about, but I think that we, we should not ignore. And in, in 1962, uh, a book, The Origin of Races, published, which, you know, as far as I can work out, was a, a, a mainstream book, not uh, by some uh, uh, extremist. Uh, and we can perhaps date uh, more modern thinking ab about uh, human genetic diversity to uh, uh, this landmark study in 1972 by Lewontin uh, on the apportionment of human diversity. So uh, what he did was uh, uh, combine uh, data from uh, uh, all of the suitable studies available to him, which at that time were using blood groups or protein markers, and tabulate how much of the variation uh, that they detected was present within populations, and how much was uh, between uh, races. And his conclusion was that 85% of the uh, uh, variation was present within populations. And so he saw that as 
putting an end to talking about human races, at least from a, a genetic perspective. Uh, and we might like to think about that as well. But it's not uh, we, in, entirely true that even at, uh, this year in the, uh, the British uh, popular science magazine, New Scientist, uh, uh, there's an article, does population genetics have a racism problem even today? So it's something that, that we still have to uh, think about. Uh, uh, so turning now to some landmarks uh, in our understanding of human evolutionary genetics, then uh, you saw this tree uh, of mitochondrial DNA in uh, Rob's introductory talk. Uh, the, the key elements being uh, uh, the inference of an African origin because the first branch led entirely to African sequences and the, the second branch to African plus non-African ones. Uh, and also the, uh, the estimate of the time for this origin to a very uh, recent time. So uh, how much, how well has this stood up to the accumulation of further data and analyses? Uh, and here's uh, uh, an analysis based on full sequences rather than RFLPs. And essentially, it completely recapitulates the uh, uh, African uh, and recent uh, origin. Uh, uh, the Y chromosome gives us a, a male counterpart to this, and uh, a bit later than the, the mitochondrial study, uh, we had a uh, uh, the first comprehensive Y chromosome phylogeny. Uh, that also led to early branches that were confined to uh, Africa, suggesting a, an, an African origin uh, and also to a very recent uh, time. Uh, and again, uh, that uh, uh, those conclusions have been uh, fully recapitulated when instead of having a handful of SNPs to work with, we have extensive sequences from the, from the Y chromosome. Uh, uh, so is that uh, 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 all that we can infer from the Y chromosome? So I hope that some of you may have seen uh, Pila Hallast's uh, uh, poster and uh, know that the answer to that is that we can still uh, discover quite exciting new things by looking at the, the Y chromosome phylogeny, uh, in particularly about the early events in the out of Africa uh, uh, migration, a, a time period that where we don't have uh, 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 ancient DNA for the period uh, 55,000 years ago to 45,000 years ago. And autosomal sequences, uh, I would argue, are very difficult to interpret uh, 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 because of the extensive uh, uh, population movements and mixing that has uh, uh, happened so much since then. But the Y chromosome, uh, uh, has this uh, superb phylogeny uh, that is very rich in this period of 55,000 years ago to 45,000 years ago, uh, where there's really a, a lot going on. And so uh, uh, what uh, I would expect uh, if we projected this phylogeny uh, onto the, uh, the map uh, uh, and thinking now just about the, the expansion out of Africa would be that the, the earliest branching lineages would be near Africa and the uh, later branching lineages would be far from Africa. 
But that is not what we see. What we see is the uh, exact opposite, that these uh, uh, early branches uh, 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 come out in the east of Asia, which implies to me a complete uh, uh, replacement uh, uh, of, of any uh, uh, earlier branches that were, were present in, in initially, and that replacement uh, uh, would have occurred before 45,000 years ago or so. <clears throat> so coming now to the, uh, the main autosomal part of, of the genome, uh, one of the uh, uh, studies of the uh, uh, HGDP uh, at this time uh, using uh, uh, STRs gave us our first genetic uh, uh, glimpse of the, the, the structure of human populations on a large scale. Uh, uh, and we see uh, Africa, we see Europe plus nearby uh, regions, and we see uh, uh, East Asia as, as uh, uh, dominating uh, uh, many parts of, of the world structure. And uh, how has this uh, uh, shown up as we've had access to uh, whole genome sequences? And this is a, a different representation uh, uh, of a, a different worldwide data set, in this case from the Thousand Genomes Project. But again, we see uh, Africa, we see Europe, we see uh, uh, Asia, and uh, uh, many uh, 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 populations in between. So, uh, 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 so uh, a, a very consistent view on that. <clears throat> uh, uh, and uh, the uh, HGDP continues to uh, to be useful. Uh, that uh, uh, recently, as you heard from Mo Almari, uh, we've been able to. Uh, to, to sequence the panel. Uh, the, the data are available on, uh, 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 in the databases with a preprint on archive, and I would uh, uh, <coughs> say you are welcome to start using the data. Uh, I chose uh, just one figure from this to show, and it's a figure that Mo chose uh, uh, as well. And this uh, uh, panel is showing uh, uh, the number of SNPs that are specific to a uh, continental region uh, uh, and plotted against their allele frequency. Uh, but the aspect that I want to uh, emphasize is, is a different one from Mo, and that is that there is no SNP or any other kind of variant that is completely specific to a continental region in the sense of being 100% in that region and 0% everywhere else. So I think that's the modern take on Luontin's uh, uh, finding. And uh, because we've looked in the entire accessible part of the genome, then this is a very strong finding. Uh, there have been some great analytical advances, uh, 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 some of them uh, based on the intuition that a, a single genome uh, contains an uh, enormous amount of information, uh, uh, in this case allowing inference of uh, population size history, showing a difference between African and non-African populations over time. Uh, 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 or the, uh, the use of uh, uh, F statistics that uh, uh, have come up on several occasions. Uh, and now uh, I turn to uh, ancient DNA uh, with a very significant landmark uh, as, again, we also uh, heard during this meeting uh, showing that 
mitochondrial DNA, the Neanderthals were distinct from uh, all modern humans. But that, interestingly, contrasts with the, uh, uh, the autosomal genome, uh, where there's an, an evidence of admixture. And, and this is perhaps the image that we've seen more times than any other throughout this uh, conference, because it, it uh, <coughs> shows us some of the complexity of the uh, admixture events in, in our history. It's not an uh, occasional phenomenon, but it's, it's been common. Uh, ancient DNA has also transformed our thinking about uh, more recent events within historical times. Uh, this is just one uh, example that uh, shows the difference between the, the blue genomes from Neolithic times and within uh, Northwest Europe and the red genomes uh, starting in the Bronze Age and uh, carrying on to the, uh, to the present. Uh, uh, a complete uh, or near complete population uh, change that really was not even suspected or talked about, at least by geneticists, uh, before this uh, work, and one that I'll, I'll also come back to later. Uh, uh, and uh, ancient DNA technology has developed so well that you don't have to be a lab that specializes in ancient DNA to, to use it. And so this is a, uh, a, a study uh, by, uh, by Mark uh, uh, Harbour uh, 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 that I, I show uh, uh, because it detects uh, an event, uh, a genetic input from the Crusaders into the, the people in Lebanon uh, that uh, is uh, uh, detectable at the time of the Crusades, but has left no detectable mark on the present day Lebanese uh, population. So this allows us to, to see transient events that we would never uh, uh, know about from studying modern DNA alone. Uh, 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 now I come on to uh, dating uh, uh, that uh, 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 archaeologists and paleontologists have a, a range of methods that we uh, 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 heard about in yesterday's session with uh, carbon-14 up to 50,000 years ago as, as perhaps the, the best known of those. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 before hearing yesterday's talk, I, I said that the uh, errors are mostly uh, well understood and low, and I'm glad that I included that the word mostly because uh, uh, we we heard about Mungo three where uh, uh, there are still uh, 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 big differences in different approaches to dating it that are uh, are not understood, uh, but still uh, uh, there's uh, uh, a big contrast between that and at least the the early approaches to using DNA to date. Uh, uh, so the intuition is that a stretch of DNA accumulates mutations over time, and if you know the mutation rate, you can infer something about that time period. Uh, and I've chosen uh, two examples here uh, from, from the Y chromosome, uh, looking at the most uh, frequent Y chromosome type in Western Europe, shown as the, the green areas here and the red shading here. Uh, and uh, this study published in 2000 inferred a, a, a Paleolithic uh, age for that lineage, 
whereas this one published uh, uh, 10 years ago uh, claimed uh, a Neolithic uh, uh, age. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's easy to criticize people uh, with hindsight, but I would say that I am an author on one of these uh, papers, and you may be able to uh, read uh, uh, which one it is. Uh, and I give this example because this is the Y chromosome type that came in with the, uh, with the Bronze Age. So uh, both of these studies got it completely wrong uh, because it's, it's just a few thousand uh, years old. So uh, can we have any confidence in genetic dates? Uh, and I think that, uh, that ancient DNA has really transformed this area as well as uh, other areas. And, and uh, uh, this is one of the, the key papers uh, that uh, studied uh, a 45,000-year-old uh, uh, sample. Uh, and uh, so there are several factors that make this so important. And firstly, this is within the age of, uh, within the range of carbon-14 dating. So this is a very secure standard date, it's well established. But it's old, uh, so uh, the authors here were able to look at the missing mutations that this sample lacked uh, in their, their very high quality ancient DNA sequence compared with present day samples. And you can see that they devote almost half of their abstract to uh, giving us mutation rates for different components of the genomes. So I think that using these mutation rates, uh, we, can, we can really have some confidence in, uh, in DNA dating. Uh, uh, and <coughs> uh, here the example of the importance of, of that is one that we heard about just earlier uh, this morning. Uh, to do with uh, the peopling of Australia. So a study of the Y chromosome uh, using uh, those dates said it must have been after 54,000 years ago. A study of the whole genomes, uh, again using uh, those dates, gave a, uh, 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 an age of 50,000 years. And, and these have certain... Uh, uh, ranges, uh, but uh, uh, they don't uh, overlap with uh, the the study here that uh, Chris told us about in the uh, in the last session. So, so what are we to make of it? I mean, either there are still uh, 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 aspects of these dates that we we don't understand, uh, or these people did not contribute to, uh, to these people. And those are a very interesting debates. So we're, we've got to the point where uh, we can have that kind of high level discussion. Uh, so questions that we have uh, uh, perhaps uh, answered. Uh, 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 where and when did the ancestors of present-day human populations originate? I mean, notice this is a geneticist question. This is not uh, asking where and when did modern humans originate. <coughs> uh, but the answer to this, uh, Africa, uh, uh, with a single major uh, exit with time intervals that we can uh, put on those. Uh, was there mixture with other hominins? Uh, yes on multiple occasions, for sure. Uh, but there are other quite major questions, some of which uh, have been around for decades that we, we really haven't made much progress with uh, answering. What genetic changes have made us uh, human? Uh, how do the genetic variants within present-day populations contribute to 
uh, phenotypic diversity and fitness, essentially an anything to do with understanding the function of genetic variance is something that we, uh, uh, we still need to work on a lot. Uh, uh, so, so now I turn to some uh, uh, current and near future uh, 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 areas that I think are particularly exciting. Uh, that, that everyone in the world is linked by a single genealogy and uh, their DNA uh, is as well. Uh, and that uh, genealogy, that full genealogy is probably something that we will never know, but uh, we can start to make uh, some progress towards it. And these are two very recent papers that uh, have taken us further in that uh, direction than, uh, uh, than before. And from such a genealogy, many of the things that we would like to know in population and evolutionary genetics just uh, pop out, like the, uh, populate, the changes in population size over time or the, uh, the loci that have been subject to a particular form of, of selection. Uh, uh, DNA from, uh, from sediments. Uh, we've, we've heard about that during uh, this meeting. Uh, there, there have been some, some great publications, including uh, ones very relevant to uh, human evolutionary genetics. So uh, uh, I look forward to a time when uh, that's just routine for uh, 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 any uh, archaeological or fossil uh, site. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, there's enormous and very relevant information uh, in our associated non-human species, the uh, domesticated animals, the crops we depend on, the pests and diseases that uh, affect us, uh, and and so I think there's uh, 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 it's going to be very exciting to apply all of the approaches that have been pioneered often on human uh, genetics to all of these species and to look at the similarities and contrasts. Uh, uh, there are still some quite difficult issues to do with. Uh, DNA uh, use and sharing, uh, and uh, we need to share data, uh, and uh, but we don't want to disclose uh, personal information that the donors uh, didn't consent to. But this is more problematic than uh, than just uh, making them anonymous. So the, the Thousand Genomes Project uh, worked with, uh, with anonymized DNA samples, but this study showed that some of those uh, donors could be re-identified making use of, of uh, some of the massive amounts of additional information that are publicly available. Uh, 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 so there's uh, a lot of thinking, including some on, on this campus, about how to share data uh, in ways that are uh, appropriate. And I think that that's uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, field for, as the amount of data expands. Uh, 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 turning finally to the a more distant future, uh, uh, that uh, it's a, a difficult uh, area to speculate about in a sensible way. Uh, this is a, a late 19th century view of how transport might be in the, the 20th century. Uh, uh, but here are some uh, uh, questions that we might consider, uh, not in any particular order and, and uh, now some, what did Denisovans look like 
that every time I go to a conference like this, I, I hope I will uh, <coughs> find out the answer to that. And the answer will be very simple in the sense that it will be a photograph. Uh, uh, there are other questions that we've heard a bit about uh, uh, the extent and nature of archaic admixture uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, uh, but then uh, uh, ancient events not represented in present-day genomes. I mean, this is of an entirely different uh, uh, order. This is most of archaeology and, and paleontology and uh, uh, ancient DNA. So, uh, uh, so that's a really exciting uh, area for uh, everyone that I see uh, uh, continuing for, for decades. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, a, a few aspects more uh, uh, related perhaps to, to, to function that uh, uh, complex phenotypes and uh, uh, their evolution. And then some, again, technology-led advances, synthetic biology meaning that we can reshape large portions of genomes or ultimately whole genomes. When synthesizing a Neanderthal genome would be an exercise in synthetic biology that is perhaps not, uh, uh, not, not uh, uh, too difficult uh, or too far into the future if it uh, would be seen as, as acceptable. So enormous potential there. Uh, so where uh, 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 will our, our field go? You can take an optimistic view. Uh, here's uh, uh, a reference to Cheddar Man, uh, who apparently lived 9,105 uh, years ago, no, not uh, too far from here, just a few hours uh, drive in southern uh, England, but, but clearly... Uh, 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 enthusing uh, people about the excitement of, of uh, scientific discoveries. Uh, uh, and there are uh, pieces like this newspaper uh, article that when you look at it, you might think is not so optimistic, but genetic uh, research is biased towards studying white Europeans and ethnic minorities are set to miss out on the, on the benefits. And their you know, view of the, the technology that's uh, used for this, this was published just last year, is uh, you know, perhaps needs a bit of updating. But, but I take this as, as optimistic. It's saying that, that we need genome data from, from everyone. <clears throat> uh, but then there are more... Uh, pessimistic possibilities. Uh, uh, another article from the same newspaper, what does it mean to be genetically uh, Jewish? That was uh, just this summer. Uh, DNA tests have been used in Israel to verify a person's Jewishness. Uh, can you prove a religious identity scientifically? Uh, so I think this this kind of misuse of genetics is is quite worrying. Uh, uh, there are more directly critical articles of uh, some of the work that's uh, uh, being done. You know, is ancient DNA research revealing new truths or falling into old? old traps. Uh, uh, so I think we, you know, we should not dismiss uh, 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 this kind of publicity. We have to be prepared to address it and to bring not just scientists, but uh, everyone along uh, with us to appreciate the excitement and the uh, uh, the, uh, the good aspects of doing uh, such work. Uh, 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, the possibilities of, of engineering our own genomes, which are something that has been discussed for a long time, but, uh, but now people are actually uh, doing it. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I think that's a, an aspect that is po potentially uh, quite, quite concerning. Uh, uh, but still, uh, uh, I should uh, 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 end on a, uh, an upbeat note. I think there's uh, uh, wonderful things to do in the future. The area is going to be exciting for, uh, uh, for all of our lifetimes and uh, probably uh, beyond. So I just uh, finish by uh, thanking some of the uh, people who've worked uh, with me in my group uh, o over the years uh, and uh, the Wellcome Trust who funded our recent work. Thank you. Thanks for that great talk. Um, you mentioned the Fu et al. paper talking about the Ustashim mutation rate and, and suggesting that that gives us a lot more confidence now in being able to put more precise ages on when these splits take place. But having hung out with geo geochronologists a little bit and discuss discussing this age that's been given to that skeleton and not questioning the technical ability of the dating and so on, but just the fact that it is a disarticulated bone found washed in a creek, uh, that it's in the age range for radiocarbon where we know we can be starting to experience some difficulties of contamination and so on, and whether it's been fully removed. It just raises the question for us, now that we're pegging everything on this mutation rate and this age, uh, how accurate really is it? But I know you can't answer that. Obviously, we'd like to see multiple dating techniques applied to these kinds of samples, and we'd like to see more samples of that age being sequenced before we could precisely pinpoint a mutation rate. But how would it actually affect the kinds of split times that we're coming up with if it were, say, much older or, or even younger? Uh, so, so that's a very interesting comment. Uh, <coughs> thank you for that. Uh, uh, and it would totally transform them. That if if the mutation rate that we're using from that uh, was uh, was wrong because uh, that that bone was older, then then all of our times would proportionately change. And if they were older, would the times get older, or would they get younger? <coughs> Um, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, that's right. If it was, if it was older, then uh, they would get older. Because w what we're saying is that those genetic dates for the Australian events are just a little bit earlier than Ustishim. So if it turns out that it was seventy thousand years old, they would be a little bit earlier than seventy thousand years.